Armored fighting vehicles, including the modern main battle tank, are often seen as the masters of the modern battlefield. Armored fighting vehicles have great speed, which allows them to maneuver and circumvent normal defensive works. Enthusiasts rush to museums to see them, play games where they can drive them, and spend endless hours discussing the advantages and disadvantages of different tank designs. Yet there is a subset of these armored fighting vehicles that is largely forgotten, and yet sometimes has played critical roles and represented desperate turning points. The history of improvised armored fighting vehicles is history that deserves to be remembered. While the definition of improvised or extemporized armored vehicles is not exact, it's generally used to distinguish those vehicles that were manufactured as armored fighting vehicles from those that were built or modified, sometimes rather crudely, to fit circumstances. In fact, some of the first practical armored fighting vehicles were not originally built for that purpose. While some prototypes for mechanized armored fighting vehicles were built as early as 1902, these designs largely failed to inspire army planners who did not see their military purpose. The Sims Motor War Car is considered by many to be the first truly armored car to be built. Ordered by the British government for use in the Boer War, complications in design meant that a prototype was not available until after the war. Finding no practical use for the vehicle, the British did not decide to purchase it, and only one prototype was produced. Other early designs, such as the French Chiron Girardeau Evois and the Austrian Austro Daimler armored car, which sported a traversable top, mounted turret, and was possibly the first armored car to use four-wheel drive, likewise failed to convince military planners of their utility. Only one or two prototypes were built. While there is dispute over the first use of armored cars in warfare, versions might have been used as early as 1908 in the Young Turks Rebellion in Turkey, 1909 by the French against rebels in Morocco, and 1911 by Italians in the Italo-Turkish War. But these were vehicles built and deployed in very small numbers. Despite the growing potential of the internal combustion engine and the development of track-laying tractors, at the outset of the First World War, no army was fueling a true mechanized armored fighting vehicle in numbers greater than four or five. But that would change quickly, and many of the first examples were extemporized armor, normal production cars or trucks, with armored plates added. A good example was the armored auto car used by the Canadian Automobile Machine Gun Brigade. The brainchild of French-Canadian Raymond Brutonel, the armored auto car was based on his idea of combining the power of machine guns with mechanical mobility. A self-made millionaire at the outbreak of the war, Brutonel offered to privately fund the creation of a motor machine gun unit. With no regular vehicles being manufactured, Brutonel extemporized using a truck chassis made by the auto car company of Ardmore, Pennsylvania, sheets of steel from the Bethlehem Steel Company of Pennsylvania, and Model 1895 machine guns made by the Colt Company. Brutonel designed armored bodies made from the steel plates, which were then mounted to the truck chassis, creating an open-topped box-like structure with a sloped front. Each auto car would carry two machine guns, which were mounted on a pedestal and would fire off the sides of the vehicle. The auto car had a crew of eight, three men to crew each gun, plus a driver and an officer. The unit was established August 24th, just a month after the outbreak of war, and activated in September. The brigade initially fielded eight armored cars, and many historians consider the brigade to be the world's first specifically designed and equipped armored unit. While the cars were clever, they had poor cross-country ability and were of little use in static trench warfare. The brigade mostly operated as a normal machine gun brigade. But the auto cars proved their value in 1918, when they were able to quickly respond to and help to hold back the German breakthrough during the spring offensive. The vehicle that Brutonel envisioned as a tool to break through enemy lines ended up being most valuable in defense. A similar idea that might actually have seen combat earlier was used in Belgium. Lieutenant Charles Henkart had two of his own personal Minerva Motorworks touring cars armored at a steelworks. Eventually, the ad hoc design was standardized, and at least 30 Minerva armored cars were produced. The Minerva armored car straddles the line between extemporaneous armor and a production vehicle, as ad hoc conversions led to a standardized design and eventually purpose-built vehicles were made. Although it had poor off-road capabilities, the Minerva armored car was a somewhat successful vehicle for reconnaissance and fire support. The car served both on the Western Front and with the Belgian Expeditionary Force in Russia, and four captured vehicles served with the Germans in Romania. The Belgian experience with the Minerva would help to drive another extemporaneous design, this time with an unexpected force, the air wing of the British Navy. The Royal Naval Air Service was established as part of the Royal Navy on July 1, 1914, less than a month before the outbreak of hostilities. RNAS units operated seaplanes and played naval roles like fleet reconnaissance, but also operated pursuit squadrons. A support section was created and equipped with Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost touring cars.
The purpose of the cars was to maintain lines of communication and retrieve airmen who had been down behind enemy lines. The section quickly figured out that the cars were more useful with a machine gun equipped, and then, after Belgium started to find success with the Minerva, had them armored with boilerplates at a shipyard in Dunkirk. The squadron was so successful at raiding that the Navy standardized the design and, by December, was producing purpose-built models, eventually producing 120 Rolls-Royce armored cars. While their utility declined as the war moved into a static phase, they were deployed to other theaters. And while the cars of the Royal Navy Armored Car Division were eventually moved under the Army, members of the unit became part of the Landship Committee that would design the first tanks. Thus, extemporized armor put on cars belonging to the Navy played a role in the development of modern tank designs. There were many one-off ad hoc conversions used during the Great War on all fronts and by most every belligerent nation, and even production vehicles were often simply armored frames on standard car or truck chassis. The first tracked tanks were, in essence, armored boxes built over tractors, although armor became much more complex and specialized as the war progressed. Tank development continued between the wars, and armored fighting vehicles were much more mature by 1939, and yet still, extemporized armor found its role during the Second World War. After Operation Dynamo, the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force at Dunkirk in 1940, much of the British Army had been saved, but much of their heavy equipment, including the great bulk of their tanks, had been left behind in France. The British Army was desperately short of armor, and that led to some truly innovative extemporized armor designs. One of the concerns after the fall of France was, of course, German invasion. The British Army was stretched thin, fighting in North Africa and trying to recover and build strength after the losses in France. The frantic efforts to prepare for invasion in 1940 and 1941 were called the Invasion Crisis. A particular concern was protection of British airfields, as the Germans had used airborne operations to capture airfields during the invasions of Norway and the Netherlands. With the equipment losses at Dunkirk and fighting in North Africa, the Army had few armored fighting vehicles to spare to defend airfields and a shortage of materials to make more. One solution that conserved precious steel was the concrete armored lorry. A former military engineer named Charles Bernard Matthews had gained experience using concrete for fortifications during the Great War. Matthews constructed a concrete box to replace the cab of a stripped-down lorry. A reinforced concrete pillbox was placed on the truck bed. The size and weight of the box depended upon the power of the lorry. The designs were not standard, although all versions came to be called Bisons after an original model made by the Thornycroft Company. The vehicles were heavy and the engines often overburdened. They were not intended to operate as armored cars, but rather pillboxes that could be moved, albeit slowly and only on relatively level ground. While concrete was not very effective against most heavy weapons, it would have produced good protection from the relatively light arms carried by airborne troops. Exact numbers are not known, but as many as a couple hundred vehicles were converted. They received national publicity at the time, where the role they played in calming morale was more successful than their likely utility might have been had they been tested in combat. Another similar innovative idea was called the armadillo. Also based on a standard truck chassis, the armadillo protected the cab with a layer of mild steel and carried a fighting compartment that consisted of a wooden box protected with a layer of gravel. While the armor was light, the troops that they were expected to encounter would have been lightly armed. Unlike the bison, the armadillo was comparatively light, and the intention was to use it as a highly mobile platform to respond to threats. Armadillos would have been kept hidden near an airbase, so they would not be targeted in any preparatory bombardment. They then would be able to move relatively quickly to defend the field from airborne troops. Larger versions included a Great War Vintage 37mm gun on the back, which would have been effective against the light vehicles and gliders with which airborne troops would have been equipped. 877 of the vehicles were eventually modified. Another answer was an extemporaneous design similar to those used in World War I, a standard passenger car modified with an armored chassis. However, because of limitations in materials, these were comically small. Built on the frame of a small passenger car made by the Standard Motor Company, the tiny armored cars were somewhat derisively called Beaverettes, named after Lord Beaverbrook, the Minister of Aircraft Production who had ordered the vehicles. Armed with a Bren light machine gun and a variety of weapons depending upon what was available, the already small vehicle got even smaller when the Mark III used a shortened chassis. The smaller version then became known as the Beaver Bug. While nearly 3,000 were produced, they were relegated to units of the Home Guard. It's difficult to decide whether these designs were truly innovative or merely desperate, but they did well represent both the fears and the resilience of the British people at the time.
but for sheer oddity they hardly match what was going on on the other side of the world. While Britain feared invasion by Germany, New Zealand feared invasion from Japan. New Zealand had no indigenous tank industry and after Dunkirk could not expect to be prioritized for vehicles from Great Britain. Desiring to produce a vehicle using available materials, Minister of Works Bod Simple decided upon the idea of a tractor tank. A frame made of corrugated metal was constructed and in the case of invasion, agricultural tractors such as the Caterpillar D8 would be modified by having the box attached on top of them. The tank had six different ports from which the crew could fire Bren light machine guns. In most respects, the Bob Semple tank was a disaster. It was tall and ungainly, absurdly slow since it was stuck with tractor gearing and shook so much that its crew could hardly fire accurately. Instead of raising confidence, the vehicles were seen as an embarrassment and lampooned in cartoons. While it's often been called the worst tank ever built, Bob Semple noted at the time that no one else was coming up with a better idea. Luckily, the planned invasion of New Zealand never occurred, and equipment became much more available after the United States entered the war. If the British and Commonwealth were desperate for armor in 1940, the Soviets were fighting for their lives amid terrible losses in 1941. Between June and December of 1941, the Russians lost more than 23,000 tanks in combat. The front turned into desperate defense of cities, even as manufacturing and heavy equipment was being evacuated and skilled workers were conscripted into the army. Improvised weapons of all sorts were made in what was left behind. This included improvised tanks mounted on agricultural tractors and armed with whatever was available, machine guns, outdated weapons, and weapons recovered from destroyed tanks. In the city of Odessa, factory workers created tanks, perhaps as many as 50 or 60, based on the STZ-3 agricultural tractor. Called the knee tank, roughly meaning terror tank, they weren't intended for combat so much as they were to fool the German attackers into thinking the Soviets had more heavy tanks than they actually did. While their impact on the two-month siege of Odessa was negligible, there were anecdotal accounts of the mere sound of their approach causing enemy troops to retreat. Another 60 to 90 Cage TZ-16s, described as self-propelled gun and built on the same type of tractor, were modified and used near Kharkiv and Stalingrad. While they can't be said to have affected the outcome of the war, the Soviet armored tractors have become a cultural symbol of the dogged defense during what the Soviets call the Great Patriotic War. Whether through their role in the development of modern armored vehicles to their deployment during desperate times, the, the development and utilization of extemporized armor underscores the psychological impact of heavy metal. And improvised armor has popped up in some surprising places, between competing gangs of bootleggers during Prohibition in the United States, or modern wars in the Middle East, or most recently, in fights between drug cartels in Mexico using something that's been referred to as narco armor. More than a hundred years after armored fighting vehicles first rolled onto the battlefield, people are still welding their way into armored warfare. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.